Hi everyone, my name is Amit Jain. I'm a pediatric and adult spine surgeon at Johns Hopkins, Chief of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery. I'll be talking about adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and sharing a case. I have no relevant financial disclosures for this talk. So the case is a 13-year-old girl who presented to her pediatrician's office for an annual well child visit. She was referred to pediatric orthopedics for concern of spinal deformity. When I saw her, there was no significant back pain. For her mom, she had a growth spurt last year. She started menstruation about one year prior to presentation. So that's important to know and important to re report in the history. It helps you understand how much growth is remaining. On exam, she had a five out of five strength, normal reflexes. As part of my reflex exam, I always check abdominal reflexes just to make sure there's no spinal cord issues. Her right shoulder was slightly higher than the left. And she actually had significant rotation on exam, about 15 degrees on scoliometer with a forward bend test. And these are her radiographs. So this is her PA radiograph. This is her lateral. And as you can see on the PA radiograph, she actually, in addition to having a pretty significant main thoracic curve, 75 degrees to the right, has a 40 degree upper thoracic curve, and then a 38 degree lumbar curve. In addition to that, as is common in AIS, she actually had loss of her thoracic kyphosis, and her thoracic spine was actually lordotic. So the real, real question here is what levels do we fuse? Because clearly this child is a surgical candidate. So as far as the UIV is concerned, I think it's important to understand what the proximal thoracic curve is gonna do. So in this particular situation, as you can see on the benders, the proximal thoracic curve doesn't really bend out. On top of that, her right shoulder is actually higher than her left shoulder, which tells me that I need to go, and go higher and be able to control that shoulder. So in this case, I would prefer a T2 or T3 as my UIV. As far as the lumbar spine is concerned, that's even more important because it's really important to know how that's gonna bend out. So in this particular situation, luckily for us, this child actually bent out quite a bit. On her left bender, you can see the lumbar spine is actually pretty straight. On the right bender, of course, that curve is accentuated. So that tells me that the lumbar spine is fairly flexible and may not necessarily need to be addressed surgically. The other important concepts are the concept of the last touch vertebra and the apical vertebral translation ratio. So the last test vertebra is essentially the relationship between the CSVL and the last vertebra that's touched by the CSVL, in this case, clearly is T12 and L1, are both, both substantially touched. So in my mind, that's a good place to stop the fusion. As far as apical vertical translation, that concept basically refers to the relationship between how much the thoracic spine the apex of the thoracic spine is translated with respect to of the lumbar spine. And having that ratio can also help guide whether or not you do a selective thoracic fusion or you fuse the whole thing. And of course, these concepts only apply to lanky BC or lanky C curves where the lumbar curvature is an issue. So in our child, I would classify her, classify her as a lanky 2BC and therefore we decided to do a selective thoracic fusion. And these were our results. So as you can see, we were able to go down from about a 75 degree main thoracic curve to about a 15 degree overall curvature. So a pretty good result. And specifically, we were able to achieve the goals of surgery. The number one goal being able to halt curve progression. We successfully did that. We, as byproduct of our planning, was able to make the shoulders even. And I think going to T2 here for our UIV really helped with that. And the shoulders are even as judged by the T1 tilt as well as the clavicle angle. And then we were able to achieve an overall harmonious spinal alignment. And then finally, which is something that I think is the most important part, is that we were able to preserve lumbar motion. So this really, giving the lumbar spine and not instrumenting it, really allows the child to participate in sports and really allows the child to be as active as they want to be. So Dr. Sponseller and I are the two adolescent idiopathic scoliosis surgeons at Hopkins. If for any questions, please email me at amitjain at jhmi.edu or call our office number. Thank you very much.